Well, let's start this over again for everyone. Uh, I think everyone can probably see the screen now, so sorry for that uh, technical difficulty. So uh, apologize for that. Uh, I will try to uh, catch up. So welcome today. I hope everything's uh, doing well. Uh, we do have uh, a lot to go over in a quick uh, session here. So I believe everyone now can see the screen, which is always a good thing. So just a reminder, your, your phones are on mute. Uh, I'm here by myself, so I couldn't uh, look at any uh, questions quickly and, and catch that uh, beforehand about you guys not being able to see the seminar. You probably just heard me, which is uh, useless with just a bunch of words. Uh, so I have a lot of visuals I can uh, show you as well. So if you do have a question, go up in that upper right-hand corner of your panel, go through the question box, type in your question, and let it go. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. It is going to be recorded, so we're going to uh, record uh, this um, webinar, and then you can go visit us, of course, on our North America YouTube channel, go to LinkedIn, Instagram, North America Facebook, and you can visit all of the recordings that we have, not just this one, which now you can see the video, uh, but also all the past ones that we've done, and we've been doing them for a long time now since the uh, the COVID a lot of uh, you know remote uh, webinars that are very interactive is what we try to do it with a camera. Uh, so today what we're doing is going over lithium disilicate. It's called Ambria, uh, pressing matter, shade consistent, and high strength production. So our material is a very unique material in the sense that it, yes, it is a uh, lithium disilicate. However, the lithium disilicate is that we formulated it to make it look a little bit better than just your average press material. It's reinforced by zirconia. Okay, it comes in a package and uh, like normal little sleeve. It comes in classical, comes in uh, 3D master bleach shades. The uh, classical shade, the, the fantastic thing about these uh, new uh, ingots, these new Ambria ingots, is that they come in B1 as well, which has always been asked for. And then, of course, you got the uh, the bleach. We're also going to have some uh, enamels uh, coming out along with additional 3D master bleach shades. Uh, level of translucency, they're going to come in two different uh, translucency, a HT and a T. Just like uh, most of your case work that you've done in the past, the uh, high translucent is going to be used for enamel replacement. So if you have something that doesn't have to shift shade, you primarily just uh, need a little bit of uh, chroma, uh, you're going to use a high translucent, you know, your veneers, your inlays, onlays. Uh, we are going to also come out with a uh, enamel type uh, ingots as well as some of you are familiar with our older PM9, pressable material 9, 9 meaning the CTE, um, we're, this is what the material is going to re, is replacing the PM9 with. This is Vita Ambria, a lithium disilicate. It's got a higher concentration of uh, zirconia oxide to help it with strength. Um, but it also has, uh, you know, these different levels. There's a small and a large ingot, which I'll go over here in a few minutes with you. Uh, Properties-wise, CTE, it's a little bit higher. Uh, approximately 9.4. Um, we're going to. I'll get into it as well. The you can uh, you can customize the uh, the Ambria after you press it by going using what's called Lumex AC AC standing for all ceramic. But we can talk about the biaxial strength uh, after pressing, after tempering. Uh, we publish approximately 550 megapascals of biaxial strength. And that's after you temper it. And then once you use it in a form that's conducive to a restoration, you know, outside the material science of uh, flexural strength of biaxial and three point bending information, this material is over a thousand newtons where that it takes that much to fracture. It's about 450 approximately newtons of natural bite force so we're well above that we can use or 490 I'm sorry we can do this with a uh, three units up to three units uh, they're anterior posterior uh, single units we can do 
anterior, posterior, full crown coverage, inlays, onlays, veneers, and so forth. So it's a very versatile material that works in anywhere in the, uh, the patient's mouth. So this is kind of a go-to now ingot, a pellet, uh, a pressable material that you can use pretty much for anything up to a three-unit bridge. Uh, it is standalone. It's not, it is not pressed on top of any framework material. It's a standalone three-unit or single-unit type material. It's got a very fine grain structure to it. Uh, this adds to the strength and the translucency, the look of it, the vitality. It helps uh, after you press it when those grains are realigned, where they're, where, when they are organized. It's very consistent with the proper shade. Um, we have about zirconia, uh, about 8 to 12 percent of zirconia oxide in this material. This is not like your traditional zirconia oxide that we use to mill and to uh, create full contour restorations with. This is the, say, the parent of the zirconia dioxide material, uh, ceramic material. This is like in its pure form that we add to the matrix of this in a homogeneous method. It's clear. It adds purely strength. It's uh, the primary constituent of this material is um, silicon oxide, which is kind of like, you know, feldspath, what we make feldspathic porcelain with, which is really the benchmark of any restorative material. So we've created a material that looks nice, that is easily polished uh, just by using a two-step polishing uh, step. Uh, we do have some high zirconia oxide type uh, polishing wheels that you can use for our zirconia, for our millable Suprinity PC, and now with Ambria. Anything of our materials that we have a high uh, concentration of zirconia oxide to it, you can use these polishers as a two-step process and make it really um, uh, gloss. This material does not have to be stained and glazed after you press it. If you want, after you press it, after you temper it, you can just polish it. Uh, VIA makes all their materials that after it's processed, uh, really you don't have to stain and glaze it, uh, which we probably pretty much should call now characterization. So if you don't have to characterize it, color it. Uh, if you don't need to spend the time glazing it, you can just polish it up with those polishers and, and make it look nice like a natural glaze of, of a natural dentition. So this is kind of what it shows after you um, it's uh, pressed and then after it is um, uh, polished and then after you uh, uh, do the fine polishing. So you got a very smooth surface and this allows also to help increase the strength. Because when you have a rough surface, uh, if it's whether it's pressed and uh, your wax isn't very uh, smooth, and then after you alter it, you machine with it, you you finish it, you know, if all these little grooves, peaks and valleys, those are all um, stress risers. You know, they're they're areas that are mini cracks, if you will. So the smoother you can get the material, the stronger it is, the more survivability there is to it. Uh, the material also is based on, a, in a sense, to feldspathic porcelain because, you know, that was that's what Vita does is, you know, they do porcelain. They've had some excellent porcelain over the years. Uh, we, we've come out with a universal low temperature porcelain, which I'll get in, into in a few minutes. But we benchmark everything with feldspathic porcelain. So we have to make sure that our materials, when they're re released, when they're finalized, they contain opalescence. They have uh, fluorescence. Um, after it's pressed, you can kind of see even a halo effect at the incisal edge if it's an anterior or a posterior on the cusp tips. You know, if you hold it up to the to the light from the back and then from the front, it's very dynamic how this material reacts with the light and then reflects back like a natural uh, tooth. And that's what al always is our benchmark uh, is to how close can we get it to make it look like a natural tooth. That's our goal. You know, to make these things uh, excellent in the mouth as well, not only for processing, uh, but also for the final result for the patient, for the health of the patient as well. 
This is just another diagram kind of illustrating on after you press it, depending on how smooth your wax is on your press, uh, what we do is we do a tempering. So to increase that strength, we do a, what's called the tempering. It's very close to what we used to do annealing on metal, uh, where we kind of help the grain structure, in this case, the tempering. What we do really do is we try to smooth out the surface of your pressed material. And by smoothing it out, by raising it to a certain temperature, and then allowing it to temper for about two minutes, you can then wet the surface. It will actually wet and gloss the surface. And by smoothing out all the, like I mentioned, smoothing out all the peaks and valleys, you now have more compression. So you have higher compressive strength or higher uh, strength as far as the uh, flexural strength, but certainly the load to failure, the fracture load is increased. So this is a, a very nice uh, method to do that. You also show the uh, uh, fluorescence here as well. Um, you know, up on the upper left side, side, you know, you've got a Mark II that's a feldspathic material. Uh, you've got the uh, Ambria that's very highly fluorescent as well. Uh, zirconia is very dark. Obviously, uh, there's really no light reaction to the uh, zirconia. They're very dead looking as far as once the patient goes outside in the natural light. So the press material is really something that you may be an alternative to zirconia. Uh, full contour, especially this Ambria, because it is has such a high flexural strength or biaxial strength. You know, most uh, patients I mentioned, you know, about 490 is uh, the biting force, natural biting force, average biting force of a patient in the posterior. You know, this is over, you know, 540 as far as the flexural strength. So something like this material can replace and look much better naturally than say a, a zirconia. But zirconia has its place. I mean, we sell zirconia as well. But because this has some um, silicon oxide material in it, uh, we are able to control also the shade. You know, it's very important. Vita is the shade company. So they have um, delivered a product that is very shade consistent to the shade tab. So by selecting the shade and then Pressing out that shade, if you hold it inside uh, a material that's a pseudo prep and you compare it to your shade tab, you will be very close to it. Any minor, uh, you know, minor nuances of chroma that you want to add, you can characterize it, add a little bit more um, stain to that. We'll go into that as well. This material we use uh, Accent Plus. And also the if we got if we do glaze it as opposed to polishing it, we're going to use the low temperature. Uh, glaze as well, but it's very shade reliable. Uh, this is uh, the universal kind of glaze and stains that we have, characterization stains we have, um, you know, powder paste and um, and spray, if you will. They're various colors, just like everyone else. You know, they're very highly fluorescent uh, that you can use. You can use different colors for whatever. Uh, you're seeing that you need to replicate as far as the natural tooth go goes. You do again. You want to use low temperature glaze with the uh, Ambria material. Uh, if you're slightly off, uh, it used to be that we, when customers called and we and they'd ask, okay, well I have an A1 or an A2, whatever it might be, and they go, well I need a stain for A1. Well, we never made in the past. We never made a stain that was called out. That was A1. We said, okay, well, maybe mix a little bit five and a little bit three to get an orangish, yellowish um, color to add that chroma that you're looking for. Well, nowadays we actually have out of the bottle, we have A, B, C, and D. And then we also have them for the 3D master as well. So these are chroma stains that can be used to adjust if there is, depending on the maybe the thickness of your restoration. If you're going to press out real thin, you need a little bit more looking like an A1 or whatever the case may be. You just add a little bit of this chroma stain to it and you match it right up. Very nice, very easy uh, to use. 
And of course, like I mentioned, we have they have all sorts of different uh, characterization colors as well to go with that as needed. Uh, the material, though, is um, excellent on its own. However, you can create whatever uh, nuance color you want. You can also begin to start cutting it back, and you can add some porcelain to it. We have what's called Lumex AC, which is geared, which is uh, aligned really with the Ambria material. This is a kind of a universal material that works for lithium disilicate CAD materials or press material, for zirconia, even our Vita, Vita blocks, uh, machinable material. So it's kind of a universal um, all ceramic material. So there's a list of things that we uh, we have validated it for, whether it's zirconia, whether it's Emax press, Emax CAD, the press, Seltra, Ambria, Vita blocks, and so forth. Um, so this is a low temperature, low fusing porcelain. That's what it's considered. It has a high temperature around 760, uh, but it doesn't distort, right? At that low temperature, it's always been, can you achieve the vitality of a low temperature porcelain? And Vita's, you know, one of the hesitancies of Vita to come out with a low temperature porcelain is really how to control the vitality of low fusing porcelain. And Vita's all actually come out, done this right, and they've got an excellent uh, material, uh, kind of based on the um, the old school stuff where you have an opacious dentin, a dentin, and then you have the enamels. We actually come out, we reformulated a, um, the, the clear or the transparent. Now it's truly, truly clear uh, material, not foggy at all, but we do offer a, a fog in this material as well, kind of like a neutral. So we have all sorts of different enamels to go with this that you can micro layer that uh, Ambria. Certainly you wanna probably try to um, do your cut back in your wax, in your wax, uh, not necessarily uh, cut it back after you've pressed it. That's ideal, but you can do that. You can take some diamonds and if you're careful, just make sure you, you don't overheat your pressed material. And this is true for any pressed material. Uh, regardless uh, what manufacturer. So you're better off to sometimes uh, do a cut back in that wax first and take care of it. Uh, this material, even though it's low fusing, it has a very great bond to it. It's about a, uh, the flexural strength of the Lumex is about 110, uh, but you've got a very nice bond, uh, adhesive bond against that uh, uh, material, Ambria and the Lumex. So again, the lume, the uh, Ambria is very per versatile, right? You can take that ingot, you can wax it, you can cut it back, you can then press it, you can then polish it and place it, or you can then um, just use characterization material and or micro layer using porcelain. So it's whatever makes your day, whatever you need to achieve that final goal of that final restoration of what's gonna look ideal. Hopefully, you know, your your dentists are providing you, obviously, with pictures. That's always the best. The material itself, uh, it has a traditional press process. So if you're used to pressing, this is a plug-and-play type material. All you need to do is just switch out your ingots and use the Ambria ingots in itself. So uh, the, the process is the same. Uh, we get a lot of calls about the... Um, uh, the sprue former, it, it's a it's a uh, a standard nine ten millimeter sprue diameter or or um, uh, plunger, if you will. So it's a standard on the standard uh, Emax CAD uh, press or uh, GC Liffy or anything else. So the only thing we don't have are large ingots that are um, for a three hundred gram. So we have a hundred gram pellets and we have 200 gram pellets uh, for that 100 gram, 200 gram um, muffle or, or ring, investment ring. Um, you know, we have uh, different uh, investments that's dedicated for pressing, which helps reduce the oxide layer, the reactive layer, uh, and is very dense. So you have less fracturing during the, uh, the process of pressing itself. So, but it's a, it's a very traditional uh, material. 
uh, as far as the workflow goes. So there's nothing special about it as far as the workflow. The material itself, uh, the investment is uh, enhanced. You know, it's, it's made for aesthetics. It's made for easy processing. But once you attach your uh, sprue to your to your um, your object to your um, wax up, you know you just want to fit it in that ring. You want to make sure you have uh, minimum uh, spacing between the, uh, the the actual wax pattern and the side of your ring. Like always, uh, we recommend a 45 to 60 degree angle of your sprue. So I'll show you how we have a little uh, little plastic. Uh, measuring uh, instrument, if you will, that comes with the kit that you can utilize uh, to make sure that you're sprued correctly on the right angle. They kind of look like this. They're made out of a, a hard, thick plastic, and I'll show that to you in a few few minutes here. But we use this just to make sure that you're within the zone of the uh, investment ring and that the sprue angle is correct. Uh, a couple of things, though, as far as your uh, transition, the actual flow, the workflow of burnout to your press furnace. So we get a lot of calls, and, and you know, it's more about the workflow, more about the processing uh, to make sure that you have less rings that might fracture or that you have the right temperature. So one of the key components is that heating the wax, melting it out. And you have to be careful that if you're doing several pressings in a day, you want to make sure that your furnace isn't overheated or underheated as far as the burnout so you don't shock your investment ring when you first initially put it out in the burnout furnace. When you remove your ring from your sprue former, that ring should still be very hot. And you can almost see that the wax pattern that you have, if you look inside of it, is actually kind of melted. So what large production labs do is that they actually have two burnout furnaces. One is at that 850 recommended burnout temperature, but one is about 100, 200 degrees lower than that, so that you move it into a lower burnout furnace temperature and allow that ring to slowly reach a temperature and stabilize. And then you move it over to that 850 and that will reduce the amount of micro fracturing of your investments. So we've got a great investment um, for the Ambria system that can, is universal. You can use it for any, any press material. Uh, it not only helps reduce that reactive layer, but it also is dedicated in the sense that it's very dense and it's, it has less microfracturing in this process. But your process is very important when it comes to press material, especially if you're getting into it. Uh, you, you, everyone will tell you that there's a learning curve when it comes to pressing. It's not necessarily the material, not necessarily the machine. A lot of times it is that, um, you know, the process that you have from moving it from your burnout furnace into your press furnace, you know, doing it at the right time, not wait until that, um, you know, pressing as the temperature is still hot of that ring and so forth. Now, the other thing I want to kind of go over quickly is Vita found that at temperature range, this is true for any material, that if you decrease the temperature, if you're outside the actual, um, you know, Goldilocks heat zone temperature for pressing, it will actually change the shade uh, a degree or two. They're, they're called deltas, but basically all it is is a color shift. So if you're higher than you need to be, uh, it will be noticeably different. If you're trying to press an A1, it's not going to come out like an A1. It will most likely come out a little bit um, darker and so forth. If it's, if it's too cold, it's going to come out a little bit more opaque or uh, or, or patient. So you got to make sure and you got to dial in um, that press temperature for whatever press material you are using. And once you dial that in, you should have very consistent uh, pressings, no matter what the press is. And then it's just a matter of how thin you can um, 
do your wax up and still press it out. So you can tweak the material, the temperature, the high temperature, you know, five degrees here or there. The ideal is to get the lowest temperature that allows you to press, say, a laminate veneer, the thinnest material out all the way to have nice, fine, marginal integrity. Once you do that, um, you should be good. Your, your shade should be out, come out very consistent. You got to be careful that you're calibrating your furnace. You're checking it for contamination. You want to make sure that if you run a window tab in there, it does come out clear. It's not foggy. Uh, you know, a lot of shade inconsistencies from when it comes to press material or ceramics is due to the maintenance of your your um, your furnace, especially if you're using your furnace for multiple type of restorations, zirconia, PFMs, and then of course press material as well. Um, you got to make sure that you check it. Uh, it's not even a clear material. These are all, believe it or not, these are, uh, it's a bad picture, but it, these were all the window of our material of yesteryear that, you know, had a lot of people, uh, management people have their technicians fire a bunch of squares, a bunch of tabs in the clear material. And you can see how inconsistent from furnace to furnace is. So if you got shade issues, it could be the just your uh, furnace itself. And you may have to calibrate it using a, um, a silver test to make sure you're at the right temperature. Uh, this is basically the middle one. Once you get to 955 approximately, uh, you should see the, the little silver rod swell up. It'll sweat and start to blow, bloat. So, and then at 965, that's where your um, dial in where you're, it becomes a pellet. It becomes a, a, a ball bearing, if you will. Uh, but you have to be, you know, you have to understand the difference uh, of the issues that you may have. You know, maybe you've got fins. Well, you have to look at your water liquid ratio, how that's mixed, the timing and so forth. Uh, or is it that you're putting it in your ring into a burnout furnace and it's shocking it because you've got, you've allowed that ring to cool too much and you're putting it in that 850 degrees Celsius uh, temperature and now you're micro fracturing it uh is the reactive layer is it is it really thick well maybe you need to change investments or maybe you've got too high of a pressing temperature so there's all sorts of different things that you can look at a pressed uh item and kind of figure out okay well maybe you know i can do some adjustments vita recommends uh this is just a suggestion vita recommends that you do a kind of a calibrate with your furnace, once you know the temperature is correct, you can get these wax patterns, which are basically uh, the uh, saddle wax patterns of a partial uh, denture. That's that's basically what these are. And you can throw in a pseudo, uh, invest a, uh, a pseudo wax up. And what you want to do is you want to see that that pattern comes out clean. It comes out almost zero reactant layer. And this, of course, is used in our uh, Vita Ambria press um, investment in the material. Can't speak to anybody else's investment material, but the investment material does um, provide a, um, say, a barrier, if you will, to not have that reaction or reactive layer at the surface as your press material changes from uh, one material to the next. In other words, we our amber is very like uh, amber looking. It's it's almost clear, and then it changes as it as it presses at that temperature. It rearranges all the the particles, all the grains, and it will transform into a, a two shape. Well, during that transformation, that's where you have this reactive layer uh, between itself and the investment. So. You got to make sure that you're pressing correctly, uh, avoiding some of that opaciousness. If it if it ends up being that way, uh, you have to check out um, your furnace and make sure you dial it in. But once you dial it in, you should be fine. You sh it shouldn't matter how what you're doing. And then from that point, it's then traditional um, removal of the sprue, the divesting, which is always a pain in the ass, but you know, just they make automatic one. Uh, you know, Whip Mix makes an auto uh, automatic uh, divesting machine that you can spin on there. Um, but 
you know, you just start slowly separating out, divest it just like normal, like anything else, use diamonds, uh, slowly grind that uh, sprue uh, nub off, right? Don't want it to be too harsh. You're going to cause too much friction. This is going to react just like any porcelain and, uh, you know, could fracture if you put too much pressure on it. The investment, I've mentioned it already, it, it, it's a specialized investment that we have that will prevent that reactive layer. Uh, and that way, it takes less time to sandblast out. Um, again, your temperatures, uh, when we give you a guideline for the muffles, these are guidelines, right? There is no exact. Maybe in your specific lab, your specific unit, you may have to adjust, uh, you know, 5, 10 degrees up or down to have the press come out the way you want it that's ideal for you. So, you, you know, these are all baselines. So always just, uh, you know, check it and then adjust it as necessary. We are a little bit hotter on a 200 gram just to absorb some of that um, the heat more. Uh, we have the, uh, I mentioned this earlier, you know, you've got different uh, single units, anterior, posterior, uh, three unit bridges and so forth. And so, uh, you know, you want to just uh, make sure that you start using the, the right amount of wax for the right amount of what you're going to press. You can with the larging get um, you know it, it'll press out about 1.7 uh, grams of wax. So like usual, you're going to weigh your wax up, and then you're going to uh, use the appropriate number of pellets um, that's appropriate for that. Uh, the small uh, unit is um, uh, 0.75 grams of wax. And you can throw two small pellets in your in your uh, screw former during the press process as well. Uh, so you know various kits and so forth that we have that are available very easily for you to introduce into your your laboratory. If you want to try it, you can. It's got a very um, competitive price for it. Uh, so you know as far as pricing for Vita, you know it used to be the old saying, "Oh, Vita's." expensive well not today i mean we're such a different company today than we were 15 20 years ago uh, you really need to look in and contact your local rep if you're interested in this contact myself uh, if you want uh, we have a lot of uh, additional uh, training uh, materials for you that we can uh, send you there's also uh, online there are also step-by-step -step movies uh, whether it's your sprewing whether it's your uh, investing or your pressing itself, the, the process, the workflow, the grinding. Uh, we even have uh, little videos on layering, micro layering itself as well. But at the at the end of the day, using the press material, Ambria, and then maybe adding maybe some Lumex AC if you need to micro layer it. Either way, you should come out with uh, whatever it is you're looking for. So. I'm going to uh, switch over here for a second. I'm going to go over what we have here. Uh, hold on a second. All right. So you should be able to see uh, this kit now. Uh, I just want to go over a little bit of what's going on uh, with the material itself, you know, what you can expect. Um, so I'm going to uh, go ahead. I'm going to probably be out of focus here for a second, so I'm going to turn my webcam off. But you should be able to see this is a kit. This is the primary kit. It's, it's basically called the starter kit. Of course, you get you get the instructions, which uh, none of us ever read instructions, but uh, there are a lot of helpful uh information in this uh working instruction that you should kind of take a look at if nothing else just to refresh yourself on the process itself so that definitely comes with the uh your kit um it also this is a nice kit because it also comes with a couple portions it, it's like a starter for the um, micro layering the lumex ac which is a, it has an enamel here uh, there's no base shades because obviously your Ambria is what your base shades are going to uh, come through as, right? So like any pressable material, you don't really want to use a press material if you're going to thin it out like a coping and then heavily layer over it. You might as well use zirconia 
Um, I mean, that, that would be more of an ideal material because then you're thinning it out so thin. And if you're going to load a bunch of uh, uh, porcelain on it and fire it several times, you want to make sure that uh, the framework itself is stable. So if you use the ambry, you can cut it back. Uh, there are guidelines as far as how much you can cut it back, micro-layer it. Uh, but here's like a neutral spot called fog material, the light enamel. Uh, you also get uh, some firing material. It's, you don't have to use ours, right? But you, you get it in the kit. You can use it and see how, how you like that. It comes with a couple of pins, uh, the firing tray itself, as far as when you if you do characterize, you stain and glaze it. Um, this actually goes along with these uh, platinum pins here that you can use. Do you have to use these pins uh, for Ambria? No. You can use any conventional uh, pin when you stain, glaze it, characterize it, or temper it. It's just that this, when you use platinum, the platinum is um, so, it, it's so thin that it really does not increase or decrease the temperature of your crown that you're putting in the furnace. In other words, if you load a lot of in, um, like peg material inside your crown, then the crown, inside your crown is cooler than it would be on the outside because of the furnace muffle. So you typically you just load enough uh, um, peg material uh, just enough so that the whatever pin you're using doesn't come in contact with that restoration, if possible. But these are very, uh, you know, con they don't change the temperature of your restoration, which is nice. So they're expensive, yes, but they're um, uh, but they're very nice to have. On some cases, you also get a pillow tray. Uh, pillow trays, of course, you have to be careful in that when you're using a, a pillow tray, which does not absorb any any um, heat, you know, you may have to adjust your temperature as well. Uh, come, this kit comes with the uh, LT glaze, low temperature glaze. Uh, so if anything uh, that is a 850, fired 850 or below, you're going to use this uh, glaze, Accent Plus Glaze LT. This is your Emax Cat, Emax Press, uh, your Empress, anything of that nature. And then, of course, you get the, the fluid with it, uh, the modeling liquid. You get the investment uh, liquid because the bottom half of the um, of the material, uh, it is, let's see if I can pull this back a little. Uh, you got the investment material, and then you've got disposable plungers that come with it, and a beaker for measuring and so forth. So you get everything in this kit that you need. You also get these uh, fancy looking um, trays here. The, this is what uh, I was mentioning earlier about uh, there's a 200 gram, there is a 100 gram, uh, almost like a sprue former. It's an adapter to help you maintain that the, the angle of your sprues are correct and that your it fits within the framework of your ring itself. So when you look at it, right, you want to make sure that you have you have it so that the angle of the sprue uh, aligns with those lines. Again, anywhere from 45 to 60 degrees. Uh, and then you can you know, reverse it, move it around, and just double check. Make sure all of your angles are correct. Uh, normal stuff, sprue stuff, you know, about 10 millimeter, 8 millimeter gauge um, uh, sprues straight off the, the top of your um, stem. Right, you can do as many as uh, units as you want, as as long as your wax uh, uh, gram, your the waxing weight is equal to your pellets. Uh, they come in a, a small, uh, large pellet itself. This happens to be the large one. Uh, this is a bleach one, so you can see kind of how how translucent they are. This is the uh, the smaller one. This happens to be an HT. And then you've got the uh, uh, the T, the uh, uh, small ingot itself as well. So let me just have time to focus here. All right. So you've got the two ingots, large one. You've got that small one. 
Uh, again, the, uh, the large one is about 1.7 grams of wax weight. Uh, you're, you can only put one large one in your sprue uh, unless you've got a, uh, a different type of sprue former and so forth. It allows the, the length of, to put two of these in. On your uh, on your small one, you know it's it's up to 0.75. So this one you can basically use um, combine two of them. Two of them are almost the size of the the long one, so you can get away with using two of these as well. But this is uh, the color how they come out. They're they're very they're amber like, and you can almost see even with the the light now, uh, you can see the actual the properties of it reflect and that opalescence so you get that orangish you get that reddish that's going to stay with it even as it as it uh, presses and uh, becomes uh, too shaded so it's a very nice material very strong material um, you should try it uh, you, you'll you'll like it uh, you know the sprue former like i mentioned is just a basic standard size sprue uh, same with the uh, the plungers. Uh, we'd like to use disposable plungers, but at the end, you know, you can have some a very nice uh, nice restoration pressed out. This is all Ambria here. Uh, no layering, no cut back on this itself. Minor um, chroma adjustment down at the the neck, just to add a little bit more color. Uh, but it's a very nice, vital, you know, looking material on its own. So you can always uh, do other things, three-unit bridge, layer it with some porcelain if you want as well. So let me go back to my um, PowerPoint here. And so, again, if you're looking for CE for this, uh, you should get an email from us that's going to direct you to uh, the CE credits. Uh, the, a reminder, the workshop, this program has been recorded. It is on our website. Give us a couple days and give us a couple days to uh, identify you and, and get you your CE as well. We submit those automatically to NBC. So we just need to make sure we have all your information and your uh, NBC, your um, CDT number and so forth. Um, but the recordings, uh, you know, we have tons of recordings. We've been doing these for the last year and a half, these uh, different various products. And so we've got an a, a entire library, if you will, of, of various products that you may be interested in. Uh, again, follow us. Go ahead and follow us. Let us know how we're doing on any of our social uh, networks, media networks. If you need to, get a hold of one of your reps. You know, ask them for a trial kit, for a, um, a, a kit, one shaded kit of Ambria to try out. Uh, this gives you all the information as far as whether you're in the U.S. or in Canada, who to, who to um, uh, contact if they're in your area. Uh, if you're not sure uh, who that might be, uh, you know, give us a call here as well. Uh, I hope that you join us some, for some future um, programs as well. Uh, we have, again, tons of different topics. Uh, this is not all of them listed as far as the dates, but we've got, um, you know, another half a year to go, and we've probably got another uh, 25, 30 webinars to provide. So we hear Paul uh, and myself, so if you need to get a hold of us, if you're not sure who your rep is, you want to talk to someone, you have any processing uh, questions, workflow questions, your interested in product, whatever it may be, please give us a call, whether it's through the 800 number or through, um, you know, direct uh, or email us as well. We're at help at vitanorthamerica.com and that'll get to us. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the material itself uh, is a very nice material. So if we have any questions, let me look and we'll start doing some questions and get everyone out of here. Uh, let's see here. So we have, um, Several questions here, so let me start. Uh, all right, due to the smooth surface, does it tend to have rainbow-like overglossing? Uh, in a short answer, no. We don't have that issue. Uh, it has been uh, made, produced in such a manner that the light absorbs it, and you the only 
rain, you know, if you want to consider rainbow, you do get kind of a halo effect. You get that orangish, reddish sometimes when you're very thin and you hold it directly into the light, uh, underneath the light. However, you know, once it's bonded, uh, once or cemented, you know, once you have um, placed it on the prep, uh, all those light dynamics are a little bit different. So that's where the end uh, result is the best is interorally where you got a dark background, you got natural light coming to it and so forth. Uh, it tends to be apparent in polishing zirconia. The great thing about our polishers, uh, and, and you do get a, like a iridescent look when, you know, some of you who have used zirconia, and, and process zirconia and you polish a full contour restoration. After you polish it, if you notice, sometimes you get that iridescent look. And that's uh, something that's going on in the surface and how those polishers react to that surface. The polishers that we have actually don't, it, it doesn't leave that kind of an iridescent type surface rainbow effect, if you will. Uh, it, it will gloss it. It will high shine it, uh, polish up really nice uh, without leaving that um, additional uh, iridescent. Now, I know I've talked to many dentists who, who say, oh, wow, I love that, how it looks pearlescent, iridescent. You know, so you got to find out from your, your dentist how they like it. And then, of course, sometimes we're always trying to cover that. Um, you know, if you polish it, it doesn't look good, then we'll, we'll glaze it and so forth. Uh, so let's see, another question here. Uh, let's see here. All right, I'm just drilling down through those questions. And all right. All right, what would be the best way to polish the polish? You know, we do have polishers um, for high zirconia because uh, we've got many. We've got the zirconia, of course. We've got suprinity. We've got uh, ambria. They all contain 10, you know, 8 to 12 percent zirconia dioxide in it. The um, we made polishers specifically for high uh, materials with high concentration uh, of zirconia. And our polishers, uh, they're called the, right now they're just called the Suprinity polishers, but um, they work really nice. However, if you um, are going to do, get a polisher from, uh, you know, from Brass or from Meisinger or whoever it may be, you should contact them and say, okay, what do you have for uh, a zirconia reinforced material, which is basically what the Ambria is. So, they have specialty polishers for the specific materials that are on the market, including our materials like Enamic, Suprinity, and so forth. And they'll have one that will work best with um, with the Vita Ambria as well. But if you can't find anything there, uh, get a hold of us. We'll we'll talk to you about our polishers, and we will uh, you know get you what you need one way or the other. Uh, so. Uh, contact us. Obviously, you can contact us just to answer that question uh, back. Uh, here's the information again on the uh, on how to contact us here at the uh, help desk. Uh, the thickness do you consider to be micro layering? Well, usually your micro layering, let's say 0 0.8, 0 0.7 millimeter thickness, right? Once you get past up to one millimeter thickness of layering porcelain, you're actually um, doing something that's more than micro layering. Right? You're, you're doing more that would have a sub layer of dentin included. Now, the Lumax does have the dentins and opacious dentins, but when you look at your restoration, generally you're going to cut it back maybe two thirds down the facial if it's an anterior, right? You're going to use that gingival third as full contour. You're just going to make a finish line and then just start layering your porcelain, usually your enamel, all right? And then 
whatever modifying portions you want, whether it is uh, kind of like a, um, a liner or a mamelon effect or uh, other colors. So I would say about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is really micro layering. Above that is you're you're getting into more of a traditional uh, layering. So I hope that answers this question. Uh, so tempering Ambria, right? It's uh, up to uh, two minutes up to um, a uh, what was it eight? Uh, I gotta recall so many numbers in my head. Uh, we're talking about uh, oh 800 degrees Celsius. We hold it for two minutes. It's a traditional like almost a ceramic firing schedule. So you know start at 455 degrees per minute climb up to about 800 but hold for two minutes and uh and that is uh good for the tempering uh so there's not a lot of that uh involved with that it's just refiring your press restoration in the furnace one more time and you're basically wetting the surface it goes to a certain temperature that will actually wet it smooth it out and that actually is what happens when we call it tempering. I uh, hope that answers that one. Can you uh, create a trial kit with multiple shade uh, ingots in the sleeve? You know what, Mike, we could almost do anything, but that is something that you definitely want to contact your local rep with. So let's see if I can find it. There you go. So if you don't see your area on this list and you see your your sales rep uh give us a call here at the office and we will put you in touch with the right sales rep but once you talk to the uh, sales rep as far as what maybe uh, an ideal trial kit is to you i'm sure that they one way or the other they can make uh something happen for you of uh you know small cost or or no cost but it, it's going to be between you and your sales rep so and that also includes you know whether you need uh you know the large ingots the small ingots or pellets and then the rings and so forth that you choose to use um how long is the ring let's say 100 gram would be held at the final temperature before it moved over to the pressing temperature well you you Put it in there for at least 60 minutes, right? So you, you, 850, once you get to the final temperature, 850, uh, you're going to, to leave it in there, um, you know, for about 60 minutes. A small ring, maybe a little bit less, uh, 50, 55 uh, minutes. And then a large ring, 200 gram, you know, you're going to leave it in there for probably about uh, 70, 75 minutes. So you're gonna that's a hold time. So once you're at stable at those temperatures, uh that's how long you're gonna leave it in there. And that's at that high temperature. But again, if you're doing consecutive pressings right after each other, uh, it may be best that you have a an additional burnout furnace at a little bit lower temperature because um you've got such when when your final burnout furnace, you know, those you're gonna open up uh, quite often and putting them into your press furnace. So you want to have another additional furnace, burnout furnace, that will maintain a good temperature. And then when you know you can move it over to the 850 high temperature and then hold it uh, for that time uh, without interfering with the door opening, uh, that would be best. So, all right. So uh, another comment, the ref refractive index is almost identical to tooth enamel. Uh, correct. The orange red is uh, the opal effect due to the crystal structure is similar in size to the enamel rods. Correct. Thanks, Felix, for um, adding that into there. All right, Yuri, uh, does does the add-on material uh, pop off on same action uh, position of edge to edge position? Uh, Yuri, I'm sorry, I don't I don't follow that. If you want to reword that and um, Kick that back to me, that'd be great. Uh, how does reactive layer result to others? All right, so a lot of your reactive layer is due to the investment that you're using. Uh, there are, like GC Lissy has it now, 
we have our own special formula of investment that helps prevent that oxide, that reactive layer, um, occurring at the surface between your investment and the uh, change that happens microscopically of this material as it as it presses and heats up. So uh, the investment is always uh, look at the investment, make sure that it's got a material that is helps reduce it. Uh, the other thing is is that the higher the press temperature is, the more thicker your reactive layer is going to be. So if you're using the right investment or the a good investment that reduces that reactive layer, but you're still getting one, you may be too hot. So you want to dial it back five degrees and go into, you know, do some tests. Five degrees each test, lower and lower. And again, what you're looking for is the lowest temperature that you can successfully press, say, a veneer, a laminate veneer, which is the thinnest, which would have the finest, thinnest, marginal edge, sharpest edge that you're trying to get. So as long as you can get the shade out, it does not affect in the shade, you reduce the reactive layer, and that you can press out to the, to the finish line, uh, to the edge of that margin. That's uh, the ideal temperature, and that's how you can also, uh, you know, kind of control the reactive layer as well. Otherwise, heavier it is, it's surface stuff, so you have to just spend more time cleaning it or get some of the uh, some of that acid bath material that's sold as well to remove or to strip um, that reactive layer, the whiteness out of that. Uh, the cost of the trial kit, you know what, I, I don't know what the trial kit cost is. That would be another uh, sales rep uh, question. Sorry about that. Um, if you temper ingot at 800 degrees, when you lose margin sharpness? No, because the material is pressed much hotter than that. There, all you're doing is is um, using a tempering temperature uh, that wets it, and this is surface wetness. So, um, so it basically sweats it. It doesn't shrink it. I mean, there, like for instance, um, uh, Emacs. Some of you who some of you who do Emacs, you fill it inside with that putty material. And the reason they do that is to insulate it, because at a certain critical temperature, you you get marginal shrinkage, um, you know, pullback. The Ambria material is more stable at these temperatures, and so it's got a larger, uh, say, window of temperature range in which you can do all sorts of things with it without affecting the actual shape and so forth. So, you know, you're always about 880, 890, so you're, you're almost 100 degrees higher when you press it than you are when you temper it at 800. So uh, it really does not affect the marginal integrity. Uh, is it safe to use add-on safely with the, without worrying about this add-on pulling off? All right, so, um, the, you want to bite into food, we can bite from the outside. Uh, all right, so the question is, putting strong pressure on the edge, is it safe to use the add-on safely without worried about add-on pulling off? So you're only as good as the porcelain, the adhesive nature between your porcelain, the bond, between your porcelain and your framework material is uh, always as good as you are uh, working within the parameters of material. Add-on material is generally reserved for uh, correcting, correcting a contact, correcting minor issues. You use very little amount of porcelain. And so the likelihood of that pulling off or breaking off is, is small. The, if you press out your Ambria material and you use the porcelain, which is not corrective or add-on, it is a, um, a low temperature porcelain that is meant for uh, various materials, zirconia, Emacs CAD, Emacs Press, Lithy, Ambria, and so forth. It was 
engineered to actually have a good bond at the right temperature. If your if your firing furnace is, is correct and you know you fire it at around 860, uh, 840, 820, depending on the material you're putting it on, right? So amber, you're going to go a little bit lower. So, uh, but once you add that on, it's got good bond strength to it. So no, we're not um, seeing any chipping or any of that nature. The only thing you have to control is possibly the material that you're adding the Lumax to if it requires like a slow cool. And I, I know, you know, many of you are, um, know what slow cool is, but I can tell you many technicians no longer know what a slow cool means. That slow cool means for us anyway, for Vita, is that it stays in your, your muffle doesn't come out of your muffle until it reaches like the softening point. Okay, so in in uh, this material, you know maybe it's a, a you know 500 550 uh, degrees before you would pull it out after you add in the 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 porcelain. Uh, zirconia is around 500 degrees as well. So depending on your substrate, your framework, you want to make sure that they your portion and your framework, they cool at the same rate so that they cool according to their CTE, their natural CTE, and you won't have any problems at all. And a lot of the issues that we've seen as, as an industry goes is that, especially with zirconia, is that, um, you know, we never did slow cooling and understood that the, um, the portion froze or cooled before the zirconia framework and the zirconia framework kept pulling, 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 and then that became weak, and that's why you got chipping. Uh, can you explain the strength of the material again? All right, so when you first press it uh, out of the out of the oven, uh, you're going to end up with uh, like 400 megapascals, if you will. That is measured with a uh, like a, 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 a size of a quarter, let's say, or a nickel, whatever you want, whatever the test size parameters are, but it's like it's flat like a, a, a dime, right, a nickel, and then you, they load it, and then at the time that it fractures, that's called the uh, megapascals of a biaxial test. So the 400 is biaxial, and then when you temper it, it smooths it out again, and you can elevate the uh, biaxial load, the biaxial uh, flexural strength, up to 540, and that's the average. And that then results in a, um, a load to failure, a fracture load of about a, a little over a thousand newtons, which is a different type of uh, test apparatus. So different different things there. Uh, when we bite into food, we bite, okay, I got that one. Uh, let's see. Okay, so if you add some porcelain to the pressed restoration, can it be glazed in one bake? So if you add porcelain to the prep, well, you can do a natural glaze theoretically, but if you're going to add the porcelain to it, the porcelain itself, unless you raise it to the a higher temperature, you're still going to have all of the, um, let's say, the brush working workmanship, um, you know, brush strokes uh, tied to that surface, right? So if you can take a dry brush and you can really smooth it out, where that you 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 have it with the texture. And or or you know the the way you 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 want, and then you raise it to a certain temperature to to kind of have it come out um, semi glaze. The answer is yes, you, it is possible you can do that, but it's going to take some work and time between your materials to work it out on your furnace what that means. And then also again use a dry brush to really smooth out your porcelain. Um, so, or only layered porcelain gets glazed and the pressing material must be polished by hand. No, so you're going to uh, always um, press. You're going to then want to temper. 
you if it's cut back you add your porcelain to it the porcelain is a little bit lower in temperature if you don't like the look of the glaze between your say ambria the press material and your porcelain if they look a little bit different because your ambria fire is much higher than your porcelain you can always prior to adding glaze or, or adding your porcelain, you can always fire your um, your ambria glaze cycle a little bit higher, all right, at the glaze cycle, which is higher than the Lumex AC porcelain glazing temperature, if, if that makes sense to you. So you don't have to polish it. You, you can glaze it, pre-glaze it. You can polish it if you want. Uh, however, wherever you're going to add porcelain, you always want to cut back that uh, smooth surface and have a semi-rough uh, surface as well. So, all right. Um, what causes suck holes in the material after pressing? So that would probably be during pressing. If you're if these are bubbles, it could be that two things. You're um, you're too hot. It depends on what, how they how how they look. Right, so if it's too hot of press temperature for that material that you're pressing, you're having bubbles. It's actually boiling, right? So it's popping bubbles. If you're talking about holes, it could be that you're, you know, which is kind of uh, weird, but it could be that your your press temperature is too low and that it's not smoothly pressing into your investment ring, right? that it's leaving voids because there's not enough flowability to your material and for it to as it presses it presses within each within itself right and, and doesn't um cause any air bubbles so it could be either but you'd have to actually look at it to determine which one it is uh, generally speaking we don't see the uh that in our ambria when we press it at approximately the right temperature 880 890 and so forth uh what is used as a good a bond agent between the ingot and the porcelain uh, we can do it you can do a wash bake if you want just like zirconia or you don't have to but we just use the lumex ac as the um uh like a bonding agent if you will so you cut back you have a rough surface you can then wet it if you want with the modeling liquid and, and make sure you use, if you use Lumex AC, which is a low temperature porcelain, make sure you're using the low temperature modeling liquid. Uh, other, otherwise, um, you know, if you use just standard modeling liquid, those modeling liquids are meant for high fusing porcelain. And at low temperatures that the chemicals that are in the modeling liquids do not burn out. So. Make sure you, if you use a modeling liquid, it is the Lumex AC, low temperature modeling liquid. Uh, you can wet your surface with that and then just add your porcelain. It depends on how much of a cutback you have. You can start with your dentins if you want, move into the translucencies, or if you're just using the enamels, uh, mammals and so forth, use that. I hope, uh, hope that helps. Uh, any ceramic material they have to meet ISO standards before you can bring it to market. So, yeah, so uh, Felix thinks. I mean, what Felix is mentioning is that the um, MPA, the flexural strength, uh, whether it's a, a three-point bending test and or biaxial loading and so forth, those are all test methods from international standards that before a company like Vita or any other company releases a material into the dental market, it must meet minimum minimum requirements. And I think the flexural strength for porcelain is like 60 megapascals or something like that. It's, it's a very it's a very low threshold. Uh, traditionally, most porcelains, uh, you know, the olden days, larger uh, boulders, grain size, you know. Um, maybe 80, 90 megapascals. Uh, the Lumax is about 110. It's in between our VM materials, VM13 and VM9. Um, but that's what that means. All right. So uh, I hope everything uh, is good. It's vetted on the uh, 
on the questions. If you have any last minute, minute questions, please uh, uh, throw them in uh, now. Otherwise, we are going to go ahead and conclude this uh, webinar. Again, if you need a, a recording of it, uh, if you want to watch it, go to our website. Um, you know, the YouTube Via North America, uh, we have all of our uh, recordings on there. All of our webinars are available there. Uh, you can get a hold of our reps if that's needed. Uh, you can visit us again for another webinar. We have Denture webinars. We have Porson webinars, Lumex webinars, um, you know, uh, how to do better uh, cutbacks, how to do uh, translucent restorations, um, you know, digital dentures. We have, we have it all. We, we have been uh, uh, working on this, uh, these webinars for a long time, uh, and we've got them pretty good, and I hope they're uh, very um, likable to you as well. You can also visit us at the help desk. It's just simple, help at vitanorthamerica.com. Uh, Felix, thanks for attending as well. I appreciate it. Um, but if no other questions, uh, we will conclude this uh, today's webinar. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we will uh, hope to see you again on another webinar soon. Thank you for joining uh, the VITA Learning Webinar. Thank you.